Okay, so we'll get, let's move on to nutritional deficiency. So vitamins, minerals are an essential part of immune regulation. Essential meaning you, your, body, your body can't survive without vitamins and minerals. That's what essential means, right? And so we look at, for example, with asthma and allergies, vitamin C and vitamin D deficiency are more common in those with asthma and allergy symptoms. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about that too in a minute. And then we got food allergies. We know that food reactions can create systemic inflammation. And so what I was saying earlier, what I was talking about earlier is that if your immune system is fighting food, so fighting all those chemicals, right, that you're being exposed to, then it has less, let's just call them resources, it has less overall resources to fight the environment. And the reason I say that is because most people that have asthma, uh, when, they, when they get their diagnosis, most of the time it's you're allergic to cedar or ragweed or mold or pollen, oak pollen or whatever it might be, or you know, dander, dust, cockroaches, whatever it might be, animals. But really, they're not, they're not really so allergic that they would have asthma if they would change this part right here. So like if they would, if, if doctors, if, if immune doctors and asthma doctors would look at these two pieces right here, then what would happen is the child's immune system wouldn't be so overwhelmed by all the chemicals or overwhelmed by, by foods that they may be reactive to, that there would be resources left over to fight the environment. So if our immune system, again, if it's so overwhelmed that it doesn't have enough resource to fight the dander, the pollen, the mold, the external, right, then what ends up happening is when those things come in in, in an overwhelmed lung, um, it's going to create inflammation and you're not going to have the immune power to deal with it. So this is a very common scenario that I see. We also have, so aside from food allergy, we also have gluten sensitivity. Now, what, here's what we know. Those with celiac disease have been shown to have a higher risk of developing asthma, okay? And so this effect may be due to gluten-induced vitamin deficiency. Actually, some really good research has found that we, we, we believe that a lot of asthma develops in people with gluten issues, celiac, because of this right here, because of this reduction in vitamin D. I also speculate that zinc plays a major role in this process too. Zinc's very important for the barrier function of your lungs. And so we see the top deficiencies in people with gluten issues, um, iron, vitamin B12, vitamin D, and zinc are really probably the big top four on that list. And you see zinc and, and uh, again, zinc and vitamin, vitamin D, we know that gluten sensitivity issues can create that through the damage to the intestinal lining. Now, aside from food, we talked about food chemicals, food allergies, and gluten sensitivity. I want to bring up something else because there's some really interesting research. I talked about this in my book, No Grain, No Pain, but if you haven't read it, um, one of the oldest known forms of asthma is called Baker's asthma. And this was actually given as a delineation for bakers, right? Bakers, not baker as in a person's name, but bakers as in people who made bread and made cake, right? And they were throwing the wheat flour and it was, as they were working with the flour, it would aerosolize and they would breathe it into their lungs. And this was a very, very common cause of asthma because wheat activates an inflammatory response in the lungs for many people. And so again, it's not even necessarily that you had to eat it. You were just being exposed to it. I've actually had clients that have come to see me who were bakers, who owned bakeries and had severe asthma as a result of being wheat allergic or being gluten sensitive. And so something to, to kind of keep in mind uh, if you have an issue with gluten or if you, if you have asthma of an unknown or undisclosed reason and nobody's measured you for gluten, that could very well be one of the reasons why. Now we go on from there to, you know, some of the other factors, poor air quality. Now, I, I think it was the EPA that published a paper recently um, on indoor air being 100 to 200 times more polluted than outdoor air because the way homes are being built today. The seals on the doors and windows are super tight and super energy efficient. And so a lot of the chemicals that are used in home building, uh, a lot of these volatile organic compounds that are used in paints, that are used in varnishes, that are used in carpets and upholsteries, are basically they're outgassing into the home, but they have nowhere to go. So that poor air quality plays a major role. This comes also back to living in a hyper hygienic environment where you're worried about germs, but not worried about chemicals. Think about this for a minute. How many people right now 
are spraying chemicals all over their bodies, their faces, their hands, their workspaces in the name of safety, right? In the name, and these chemicals are anti-life chemicals. And many of you, when you're indoor air quality, you're living in that, and then you're also lathering yourself up in that over the fear for a virus. Again, that that exposure to germs versus that hyperhygienic chemical exposure. Those two things have to be balanced out. So poor air quality is a major one. We've got air quality issues outdoors too. Those of you right now in California with the wildfires certainly are probably struggling in a big way with air quality right now. So what can we do here? Probably one of the best things you can do to, to accommodate air quality in the home is let your house air out. So if you're buying a new home, if you've bought a new home recently and you can smell that new paint or that new carpet, open the windows, create a cross draft, let mother nature come in and say hello. There's a law in biology called the law of passive diffusion. What that means is that a, a substance will travel from the area of greatest concentration to the area of least concentration. So if you've got, if this are the walls of your home and you've got all these little chemicals concentrating and not being able to escape, if you open a window, that law of passive diffusion says that these chemicals are going to disperse to the area outside where there's a lower concentration of these chemicals. That's called passive diffusion. So these chemicals will, will basically, you, Mother Nature will basically dilute them for you. So open that house up, get a cross draft, especially if you open the front and the back windows, you get a nice breeze going through the home. You're going to get a lot of that outgassing out of your home, which is very, very important. You're not going to be able to build a home that's totally green that has no chemicals. It doesn't exist. And even a lot of the chemicals they're using in green building today, we're going to find in 10 years or 15 or 20 years that they're not all that good for us is what we thought. So that's that's always the case. It's all It happens every year we learn of a new chemical we thought was safe actually wasn't. You're not going to be able to build a home without chemicals. So you've got to air it out. The other thing I would recommend is ultrafine HEPA. And there are different kinds of devices. And if you're interested in the one that we recommend personally, you can visit glutenfreesociety.org. You can go there, visit the shop. And then there's a section on lifestyle. Um, and there's an air filter that we recommend that, that is an ultrafine HEPA. So it picks up all these chemicals, right? And it pulls them out of your air and helps keep your air clean. I actually, I have one at my house. I have one in my office because I want to keep my air, personal air clean as well. Then we have environmental allergens. I mentioned this earlier. So again, if your body, I said before, I said if your immune system is so busy fighting food and chemicals, it doesn't have the resources left to deal with things like ragweed, pollen, cedar, mold, and other outdoor allergens. And so these things, we know a person can definitely be allergic to them. I mean, if you've lived in anywhere in the, in the hill country in Texas, there's something called cedar fever that's very common. But not everybody gets it. And one of the reasons not everybody gets it is because some people have really strong and good, healthy immune systems. And so these things don't bother them as much. So again, the stronger you can make your immune system, the less prone you are to developing allergies and asthma. This is actually something we absolutely know we're sure of. So then we have infections. We know that like viral and bacterial infections, especially if we're talking about asthma in the lung and in the airway, we know that these things can trigger inflammation in the lungs, making it harder because you get fluid accumulation and fluid buildup with that inflammation uh, in the lungs, making it harder to get that oxygen delivered. So remember what I said earlier, I said that this reduces immunity. Processed foods reduces immunity. Nutritional deficiencies reduces immunity. Food allergies increase the burden on your immune system. And all these together, right, including that gluten, that poor air quality, increase your risk for developing those infections. And so in my experience anyway, generally, these things come after the fact. These things, when kids have asthma or adults have asthma, they tend to get frequent infections, not because the infections are causing the asthma, but because the weakened immune system that's led to the asthma has put them at an increased risk for developing the infection, and so they're more prone to it. We see this a lot, too, in people with a strong, strong history of antibiotic use. Why? Because antibiotics wipe out the flora. So if you're, if you're on an antibiotic, okay, you got to keep that in mind. That's like, it's not like having a cesarean birth, but you're knocking out your natural flora in your gut. They don't come without risk. Now, if you've got a major infection, you, you might die from, take, you know, follow your doctor's orders, take that antibiotic. But some doctors dispense antibiotics like candy, especially in kids. Oh, you got a little sniffle. Here's an antibiotic. Oh, you have a sinus issue. Here's an antibiotic. Like they hand it out 
without any without any kind of explanation of the long-term consequences on the immune system. But chronic antibiotic use can destroy your good gut bacteria, and that can lead to an increased for risk for infection, including one of the types of infections. I didn't list it here, but fungal infections are, are a very, very common issue. And I, I know there was a study published, I think it was the American Journal of Medicine, um, on it was the study was actually geographically here in the Houston area. And what they were finding is the most common cause of airway issues and sinus issues was actually not viral or bacterial, but it was actually fungal. And so this is one of those things, if you've got a strong history of antibiotic use, one of the side effects of long-term antibiotic use is, is yeast overgrowth and yeast and fungus. This is a fungal infection, right? So you've got to, you know, have that conversation with your doctor. Don't just take the antibiotics like candy. Um, it's one thing if your life is being threatened by the potential for an infection. It's another thing if, um, if, if you're just taking it just in case, which again, that's a lot of the scenario that I see. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.